Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Grand Rounds. Uh, this Grand Rounds is special, special to all of us, special to me, and um, it is our 24th annual William Winters Lectureship uh, to honor our own Dr. Winters. Um, he does not need an introduction. I think it's wonderful to have you here with us, Dr. Winters. Um, and uh, I know in the, uh, just uh, before we started, said uh, we're looking forward to some reflections from you from time to time of how can you age so gracefully and at the same time stay so productive in cardiology in so many ways. So it's really amazing. As you know, Dr. Winters retired this year, but uh, I don't think he's retired. Um, he has been uh, an amazing, productive individual. As you know, his accolades here in Houston and in the nation have been in leadership positions in so many ways. President of the American College of Cardiology. Actually, he was at the first ultrasound laboratory here, echocardiography laboratory in, in Texas, in the Southwest, and uh, has been an amazing, prolific writer um, from Houston Hearts to uh, the two more recent books, Reflections, and uh, an amazing, actually, small book, Rumination of a Synchronist. And if you don't know what that is, I think you should read it because it has a wonderful collection of limericks. So Dr. Winters, thank you for, for you being here and leading us in cardiology for so many years, and it's great to see you. Uh, our lecturer for the 24th uh, annual Win uh, Bill Winters lectureship uh, is Dr. Harlan Krumholz. I think uh, if you are in cardiology and if you are in uh, patient care, uh, his name is no stranger to anyone. Uh, Harlan has been an amazing individual. He is a, uh, the Harold Hines Professor of Medicine at Yale, and he's a director of the Yale Center for Outcomes Research uh, which is really an amazing center to uh, look at outcomes, uh, certainly patient-centered care, and how can we improve patient care. He's also the co-director of the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars, which uh, emphasizes basically uh, emerging leaders who are interested in healthcare and certainly health policy and healthcare. Uh, he graduated from Harvard. He had master's in health policy from Harvard School of Public Health. Um, if you know something about Dr. Krumholz, he's a passionate leader, and I think his, um, his aim, his focus has been from the early days on patients, outcomes, how can we improve care, and all his honors basically reflect his productivity and his passion towards that. He's a member of the Institute of, of uh, Medicine. He was a distinguished scientist of the American Heart Association. He was on the board of trustees of the ACC, and this is where we got to meet and work together, and it was an amazing experience. He's on the board of the American Board of Internal Medicine, and was appointed by the government to the Board of Governor of Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is PCORI. He is the founder and editor of Circulation Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. He is the editor of Cardio Exchange, and I know our new generation uh, know that about Cardio Exchange, and this is where you have a forum to discuss about cardiovascular medicine. Incredibly productive with more than 800 articles in this field with two books. So him and Dr. Winners share about productivity in books. and. Uh, He's really an amazing leader uh, in the nation and worldwide, and he's been honored from uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese Society of Cardiology. And it's really wonderful to have you here with us, uh, Harlan, talking about personalized medicine and computational cardiology, how to enhance cardiovascular care and health in the next era. Great to have you. Thank you for that far too gracious introduction. I will point out to you that, um, first of all, let me just say I'm so honored to be here. And, and I'm here because it is William Winter's uh, uh, lectureship, and I uh, have great admiration.
for one of the pioneers of cardiology in the country, someone firmly committed to patient care who's made such an impact. And it was my pleasure to accept and come down here. But I, I, for that, all that introduction, I just want to make the point that in your uh, brochure, when you list uh, accomplishments, his accomplishments are at least three or four times mine. And uh, I, I think it's a pretty impressive uh, set of, set of uh, accomplishments that, that he's been able to do during his career. And, uh, and it's a humbling amount. And uh, you set a bar for all of us. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for, and for having me here. So look, this is a, a talk about thinking about where we stand in cardiology, what is and what can be what we're on the cusp of, you know, everybody on a day-to-day -day basis is embroiled on the front lines with, with trying to make, uh, you know, things as good as they can be to take advantage of the knowledge that's out there. But we, I think, have this feeling that things are about to shift. And I'll say that I firmly believe that medicine is entering this era of an information science. In, in some ways, it always was. But the skills that you're going to need to be able to keep up, the ways in which you're going to be able to pull together data and information, in order to personalize the care. And this isn't ever to discount the importance of what it's like to have the human interactions, to be able to be a coach, a support, a, a, a friend, a mentor, a guide uh, to the patients that you have. But it's to say that <clears throat> we will be neglecting an opportunity to elevate our performance if we don't fully leverage the opportunities that are coming our way in this next generation, this next era of medicine. And the question is, who's going to lead this era? How can we show by example what's possible? And then how do we spread it so that it's done in intelligent ways? Because like every new era, there is the potential for unintended uh, adverse consequences. We can do things wrong. We can make things worse. So for all the potential to do better, uh, we can make things worse. Let me just start, uh, I wanted to, to make uh, disclosures. I've got the, maybe the usual disclosures of uh, someone who's working with a wide variety of organizations, but I've also, uh, I mean, I'm gonna mention it in this talk, have, have started a, uh, I have a startup that is trying to create a platform, a social enterprise that enables people to accumulate their data and share it with clinicians and researchers and others. You'll hear a little more about it, but I wanted to make sure that disclosure was, was clear up front. So here's the, conceptualization of the central problem. Uh, I think that the current medical research enterprise cannot keep pace with the information needs of patients, clinicians, administrators, and policymakers. And you all know this. This is the story of your life every day when you're, you're having to guess. You're not quite sure. You're pulling numbers out of the air or, or from a wide variety of sources, but there's an unease about whether or not for this individual, I really have the evidence I need to be able to articulate something with any sort of uh, definitive nature to it with regard to what the risks and benefits are, the trade-offs. And so you, this is the art of medicine now, but the truly the art of medicine is the paucity of evidence. What we should have is good evidence that informs the choices and the art of medicine is working and understanding the preferences, values, and goals of the patient in front of you, helping to balance those trade-offs and making the right choices at the right time for the right person with them, not to them, not for them, but in collaboration and understanding who they are and what they need. Of, of course, there's settings, emergency settings, where you're just springing into motion and you've got to make a sort of spinal reflexive actions in order to save a life. I, I'm talking about deliberative situations where that information is, is critical to being able to make the right choice for the right person. And so I began to, to start to think about this, reflect on it. I wrote a, a, a series of pieces where I'm sort of starting to think about what, where are we, what's everything else, what's going on around us in the world, what are other industries doing? I'm sort of thinking about data acquisition, curation, I'm thinking about big data, the promise of it, where's it going to really lead us, starting to, to, to move a little bit into machine learning and thinking about these techniques that are very common at Amazon and Facebook and, and, um, and Microsoft and, and you know, Google and all the places that we're seeing where we leverage every day, but I'm seeing absent. I mean, well, I'm, I'm taught logistic regression when I'm, you know, starting to go and learn epidemiology and research methods. And that method was pioneered 50 and 60 years ago, and it's what we're still using. But I don't see Google using logistic regression to sort of predict my search. I don't see Amazon uh, trying to do uh, that. I'm seeing them using different methods and trying to start thinking about, well, what's the relevance to us? How is that fit into us, and I'm going to our meetings and I'm seeing no one really talking about this. I'm looking in our journals, 
And when I was editor of Circa Outcomes, I'm saying we don't even have the reviewers who have the knowledge base to be able to evaluate this. How are we going to validate whether it's right or wrong? What, what are we going to do in terms of being able to judge it? Much of this can be a black box to us. But truthfully, tell the truth. When you saw logistic regression, it's a black box to you too because someone's just saying, I did logistic regression and here are the results. There's no way to knock on and see whether or not they actually did the right thing. They were, they, you can just, to the best of your ability, look at the methods, but it's a little block. So uh, I'm also starting to think about our tendency to write articles, create guidelines, and all of it around a sense of average. So even on our biggest trials, we'll do the big trials, we'll take five, seven, 10 years to do the trials. We'll enroll 10, 20, 30,000 people. We'll randomize them, and they're all built to tell us an average result. They're, in fact, powered precisely to tell us what an average result is for everyone in the trial. We didn't enroll one more person that we needed than to give us the power to find the effect size we expected for the overall group. Every time we go subgroup or anything like that, we're doing exploratory analyses on underpowered groups that it was never truly designed to answer the question for. The question we're asking on every experiment that's run on a large clinical trial is what on average works for this large group? Well, I, I like this picture because there is no person this person. This is a composite picture of all these people. So you tell me, who looks exactly like that person in the middle? No one does. No one does. And so it's a question for us, too, when we do a large-scale trial and that somebody sits up at the late-breaking session to much fanfare and says, this therapy A is better than therapy B by an absolute of 2%, a P5001. And now you should look at the inclusion, trial, inclusion criteria for this trial and think that it applies broadly to everyone because in our forest plot for our underpowered subgroup analyses, we didn't find anything. Or even worse, this little group down here looked like it didn't uh, experience a benefit, but, but I looked at 30 groups, and now what am I supposed to do with that? But that's the state of our science. It's now all of a sudden that'll migrate into our guidelines. Class one recommendation. Give everyone who fits this large group the same thing. Assume that the average works. This is uh, average pictures from people from different countries. But no one from every of these countries looks exactly like this. And not only that, you've got selection into trials. So not only the inclusion criteria and the heterogeneity within the people that are in the trial, but it's a slice of the people, the, the frailest, the oldest, the most complicated patients that you deal with will never get into a trial. And you know that. So how are we going to start to, to make sense of this? So we're thinking about several different areas where we should and need to improve. Now, one of these areas is around prediction. And the question is, has our tendency to be very reductionist in our approach to prediction led us to underperform in our ability to provide estimates that give us some sense of what's going to happen to any individual person? Now, we... we you know, prognosis is a central part of what we do. Understanding what's likely to happen to people is an important underlying piece of information for almost every decision that's made. So in the past, far past, we wouldn't even have the simple prediction scores that we're using today. We would take a look at the people. We'd take a look at this, and we'd sort of backhand our own estimates in our mind about what we thought. And, and your estimate might be very different than my estimate. And, and you know, this, the, the movement towards risk models was an attempt to create some advance in standardization, but, but I think it's falling far short of, of where we are. So, so take, for example, I'm just going to throw out some things that are on my mind lately about this. So prediction at one year, for example, are the predictors the same throughout the period? What we do is we take a set of variables at a certain period of time, we do our traditional mathematical models, and we say, what, what's the event rate at one year? And then we, we look and see how it predicts. But we're basically not doing anything fancy. The variables that are predicting the one-year outcome are, are basically, we're not looking at how they might change over time. We're expecting the coefficient, the predicting, prediction of that variable to be the same for a zero-one event that's occurring over an entire year. Can you imagine after you've had bypass surgery or PCI, the strength of certain predictors in an early period might be different than they are in a later period. What predicts in the first month might be different than what predicts in the last month. They might even go in opposite directions in, in terms of whatever it is you're predicting it. This is just a simple thing, but, but we, we've, we got to the point where we just said, let's just simply crunch all the events in one year 
down 0, 1, and we're going to predict what happens in one year without paying attention to that. How about updating over time? One of the things that's bothered me about a lot of our prediction models, we'll predict 10 years. The Framingham risk model predicts 10 years. Everyone sort of stops at a time zero. Let's start here and predict far out on a horizon. Well, I don't know about you, but I tend to see people again before 10 years. So the big question for us in practice is, how do I continue to update the estimates building on what I knew before? So not, that is, I don't want to start all over as if no past ever occurred. So how do I update the information? What do I do with time dependency of information? How do we stream it in a way that we're understanding risk as something dynamic, not as something that just, I've got to start here, and the best thing I can do is predict far out, as opposed to understanding, well, what are the different scenarios, by the way? Um, you know, we have these composite endpoints. It's a really interesting thing here. We know that we need the power to be able to predict. We know we need the power in trials. But what we've done is to say, well, how do we, how do we increase the number of outcomes so that it will enable us to do the kind of calculations that are necessary? So we create these composite endpoints. Well, that makes sense. Let's sort of put together CV event, stroke, CV death, revascularization, heart failure. We'll, we'll, it'll make sense to us in a construct of it's the kind of things that people in this room take care of. It's cardiovascular. So we'll create a cardiovascular endpoint. But you know that the predictor's relationship with each of those outcomes is likely to be different. Once you mush them together as a composite endpoint, it may be what you want to know in the end, what's your risk of a whole range of, 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 of uh, events. But you know something like hypertension has a very different relationship with stroke than it does with heart failure, than it does with MI, than CV death, and, and so on. And, you know, again, it's about the sophistication, the sort of thinking. In the end, you may want to roll up a variety of ones, but you can't get by with too few events simply by pulling together a heterogeneous group of outcomes. They may sound same because they fit under cardiovascular, but their relationships are different. And, the, and, and this is just another example of where we're kind of not paying attention. Now, I'd say, how about predicting anything? Are we making the most of past history? Are we losing valuable information with yes, no predictors? I'm, I'm of the, my team is tired of me saying this, but I sort of say, what we want to get to is away from a reductionist approach where we just compress everything into yes, no. So I say, you want to know the music before in order to predict the music after. I don't want to just look at a song and say, was there an F sharp somewhere in the last, you know, 15 stanzas? Yes. You know, and was there, I don't know, was there a B flat? Yes. And then that's what the, that's, and then you try to figure out what that song was by how many notes you had by just compressing everything together. That's what we do in medicine where we say hypertension, yes, no. You know, without regard to severity, the type, it, it, treatment, anything. When did it occur? Were they hot? What were they hospitalized for? We, we, we are so reductionist in just trying to compress everything. We know, we want to know the story in order to think about what's coming up. By the way, when we predict the future, We'd prefer not just to predict yes, no in 10 years or five years or one year. We want to know the music afterwards. How, is the, how are the notes likely to play? And by the way, you like to know how are the notes going to play with different strategies. So you can actually lay it out and look at what the possibilities are. Um, predicting anything. Are we missing how variables interact and become more or less important? If you look at all of our prediction, we by and large treat variables singularly. But I believe that it makes a big difference, the context. I, I, I sort of say it's like this. It, it's almost like an enzyme reducing the activation energy. When, when these three factors with two other cofactors are together, you get something very different than if you just have them apart. And so there's a, there's a situation, take heart failure and, and uh, just as one that seems obvious to me, in renal dysfunction. I think it's worse than having them apart. If you've got someone you're trying to manage and you've got those two together, it's particularly toxic. It's particularly challenging. That's different than just considering everything in, as if what's renal dysfunction by itself, what's heart failure by itself, well, they got two, let's just add them together. There's a certain synergy, we would say, an interaction that occurs. But we haven't really explored this to any great extent. And I also think it extends beyond just clinical, so that in the case, for example, of 
socioeconomic status. We like to say we treat everyone the same. We don't pay any attention to that. But the truth is we have people who are experiencing very different challenges in their lives. Challenges around what access they have to food and diet. Challenges around what they can afford with regard to medication or access to health care. And those things ultimately can be very potent. An example of that with regard to this potency is I can look at diabetes, but do you know diabetes in people with, with uh, limited uh, economic resources is a very toxic disease. You look and you rarely see amputation in wealthy populations of people who have diabetes. It is still in this era not uncommon for amputations to occur among those without economic resources. If you ignore that, you're misunderstanding prognosis, situation, circumstance, and you're limiting your ability to truly help people and to eliminate disparities if we don't understand the challenges that people are facing in their lives. So th this idea of the potency, the way that all this comes together, I think is, is critically important. Now, there's something else in prediction that I think is, is really important. Now, take a close look at this slide. Uh, I think it's a good one. So uh, th they're so excited they're looking at a pregnancy test. And, and it's positive. You know, th that's a, 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 you know, they're celebrating. Well, I find that a lot of times we are... Uh, trying to improve prediction where actually we already know the answer pretty well. You know, I, I say this because, you know, people come up to me, either it's too much precision, I don't need to know to the hundredth place what your risk is. Like, th that's a little too precise. It doesn't, and it's a false precision besides that, but I don't need to get that precise. Or, this patient's crashing, I don't need someone to run a risk score to tell me they're in trouble. You know, it, it's, it's an obvious thing. So, it's also about being smart about where in the course of the work that we do does better prediction of risk matter? And how do we incorporate that into our work floral and use it? But how do we not force it into situations where any reasonable uh, clinician, doctor or nurse, knows what the answer is? And that's why I particularly uh, like this slide. So what about communicating information? I want to just say, uh, take a minute or two just to linger on this point because I think it is also very important. So we can improve the mathematics, which should be under the, under the hood. But the question is, how does the, what, what gets translated out? And, and, and I think if you look, you know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, patients can't understand that complicated stuff. And I hear, uh, actually, some people tell me doctors can't understand that complicated stuff. Uh, you, you know, the most amazing thing to me is some of the smartest people in the world became doctors and nurses. They went through a whole trial by fire. They had to pass all sorts of difficult tests. And then when they become clinicians, you're told, you've got to make it so simple for these people. You just don't, you can't believe what you've got to do for them to incorporate it into their practice. And I think what it is is a fumbling of the communication, the, the way in which information is being communicated because of bandwidth issues, because people are so busy and have got so much on their mind. It's not about intelligence either I believe, for patients or for doctors and nurses and other clinicians, but it's what we're doing. But what do they do in weather? I mean, just think about the dimensionality of information that's conveyed on this map. Now, you know, there's a lot here, and, and yet most people get it when they look at a map. And by the way, I don't know how many of you went to the training session for the Weather Channel. Did you spend eight hours getting trained? about how to read this and understand it? I mean, I don't know, did you get, did, did, how many people here are certified in the Weather Channel? I, I just want to know. Y you know, it, it's, what was their charge? Create a user interface and a presentation of data in a way that anyone can understand. By the way, I'd say same thing with iPhone. This is what drives me crazy about the EHRs. Who spent five minutes making an intuitive EHR? No one. Who cared? No one. Long training, non-intuitive screens, difficult numbers of clicks, because you're trapped because you're trapped. Weather Channel has to attract you, so they have to figure out how to make this easy. They find a variety of ways of giving you dashboards so that you don't have to know anything about all the complicated calculations that went into this. And you can glance at this in a minute. Nobody has to tell you what that sun behind the cloud means. I don't know, do you see the legend at the bottom on that? I mean, the sun shining brightly. I mean, I, I, was, tr I was baffled here because there was no asterisk, so I had to go down to the bottom and figure out what that meant. I mean, I had to go online and search sun in a weather panel. You know, but, but you look at this and you see the different colors. The map itself is providing you information. The, 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 the way, you know, you, you know that the, 
up at the top, there is a legend. So immediately and intuitively, you, this gets communicated to you what? Does it take you half a second looking at this to know what it means? I, didn't even, I don't even tell you anything about this. I just flashed this on here. There's no context to this at all. You know it, and no one trained you. No one trained you. You know, 50 years ago, they didn't have this. So it came on board. It was starting to be disseminated, and nobody got any training about it. And then, you know, I like this just to show you. Uh, I have to be careful because I'm in Texas, and sometimes uh, these hurricanes affect you, and, of course, we take them all very seriously. But I, I think what's really interesting here is the way they show uncertainty. Who needed to be trained about how uncertainty was communicated here? You know where the hurricane is today. We're projecting where it might be. This is the funnel. You know, it's either here, 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 here. It gets wider over time. You've got time markers going out. I mean, I'm just suggesting to us that if we spend a little time thinking about the communication of the information, we can do a whole heck of a lot better in trying to get everyone on board and informing choice. The more we make it difficult, the more we sort of impede, create obstacles to the communication of the information, the more everyone turns off because they've just got too much to do to spend the time to invest to try to understand it. But in every case of all of these, I'm presenting to you very high dimensional data that was collected in very sophisticated ways and that underwent very high level advanced analytics. But then its ultimate output is something which everyone can understand intuitively and nobody has to say, I didn't get a PhD in meteorology, let alone physics or in any other quantitative science in order to immediately grasp this. I want to just bring up one more example that I think drives this home, which is, um, I guess that what drives this home. So it's, uh, <laughs> but, but think about this issue, right? So what's one of the things that plagues all of us trying to figure out traffic, you know, creating a strategy for this. So, you know, the, there was a very interesting uh, thing. So the information that goes into assessing traffic is actually quite complex. I pulled this from an academic article that was showing, I didn't actually realize this until I started studying it, that in order to understand the traffic, it's actually streaming in from different places. And interestingly, one of the most important places, as you may know, is your own phone. So there's an analogy to this within medicine where we're saying actually the drivers themselves are all contributing information to help the next driver. That actually doesn't help you because you're right in that situation at time, but if you want to know what's a mile ahead of you, that's because of the generosity of the data donor who's allowing that to occur. Now, in medicine, I'm pushing more for a more overt permission. You, you even may be shocked that your, your data is being taken that way. But there's sort of a social compact around this. I think we all have agreed that it's, it's, a, it's beneficial. And by the way, this occurs in almost every country. When I'm in China, they have the same kind of system that we have. People are sharing data about speed, and it's, it's contributing to knowledge about traffic patterns. But it's not just that. There's sensors on the highway. It's coming from all sorts of different points. Complicated data from different sources, even data donors of the participants, analogous to our patients. And, and then what do, you, what do you do with all of that? Oh my God, how would people possibly understand that? What are we going to do to make this thing intuitive? How many hours of training will you need to be able to synthesize that? I think none. None. Because people spent the time to say, how are we going to present this in a way? Complicated information. And what is it that people need? I don't want to overload them with extraneous information. They don't need in the intermediate stuff. What do they actually need to know? And you know, you look at this, and then you look at some of the programs like Waze, where they may show you where a policeman is, or where there's something on the road, or a couple of other pieces of information. But, but, but they, it's customer focused. The information is tailored to what it is you might want. And I think it's very elegant. So that's on the prediction side. We're also, I think, thinking a lot about prescriptive analytics. So people talk about comparative effectiveness, but it's about trying to understand what's best for you. This is an intersection with precision medicine and comparative effectiveness. I don't think it's about telling people what to do, but it's about trying to understand what the trade-offs are for people at a very personal level. So for example, deciding on the best anti-hypertensive approach. How are we matching people with target, with therapeutic intervention? I mean, I hope that when you all are finished with your careers, you'll look back on this era with puzzlement. Puzzlement, that, that these simplified average targets were being promulgated, and that these, these diagrams were being based on what? Age, race, 
almost nothing. You've got extraordinarily heterogeneous groups. And so when a patient comes in, it's a, I'm not sure, let alone the fact that the trials are a little conflicting and there's, by the way, there'll be new guidelines coming out uh, in just a, a month or two, maybe at the ACC even, if not a little bit after that. But, but we're in a setting where we're putting people into boxes that are highly heterogeneous. And by the way, what choice of med do you make? It, is it really plausible that for everyone the, the choice of meds really doesn't matter? Maybe race? And by the way, it always bothers me to say race is a stratification because is it really true that, that all African Americans are going to react similarly so you can put them all in that box and that, that that should be a different algorithm? I mean, it's implausible, just as it would be for any group. So how are we going to move to get the knowledge that we need? Anticoagulation, I could have used this slide for prediction or prescription, which is, you know, really? So are we, how are we approaching people with AFib? How are we matching them with therapy? This idea, even on the wards today, we would take uh, an intern or a medical student and ask him to tell us about the chads vas 2 score as a way to stratify risk. Let me just get this straight. So we're going to say hypertension, yes, no. No matter what kind of hypertension, no matter how long you had it, no matter how severe it is, no matter whether it's treated or not, you know, heart failure, yes, no. Diabetes, yes, no. I mean, similarly, without any respect to any sort of past history, age, yes, no. A anyone over a certain age is a point. And women, all women, no matter who you are, you get a point. You know, it, I don't know, if I were a woman in this room, I would be offended. Like, okay, wait a minute. You're saying we all have the same extra point for that. I mean, you can't specify to any greater extent around that. And this is, comes from an era where I can't give you a risk score that's more than 10 variables. You gotta be able to do them on fingers and thumbs. And you gotta be able to go down them. And I gotta give them so you can calculate them in your head. Let's see, one. And I make it easier. If you're older and you're a woman, that's two points. Get anticoagulated. Makes no sense. Makes no sense at all. You know, you're all carrying computers. You all have access to computers. I mean, imagine if that were true for the weather. I don't know. Or if it was true for driving. I mean, I don't know if it's, there's a cloud, that's one point. If there's some wind, that's a point. I, I don't know. It feels kind of humid, that's a point. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't match the sophistication that needs. Now, I understand it's a shame, but we're in a low stakes profession. What we do doesn't really matter. So we can be the last to adopt the sophisticated and advanced techniques. I mean, we can aspire to work in a field that matters, that's consequential, that may even one day affect someone's life, and let the groups that are really doing things that matter adopt quickly and, and be on the cutting edge. But you know I'm kidding. I mean, this is really a, a shame that we're in this circumstance, and we've got to change. So the third one is, so I was saying, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about uh, prediction prescription, prescriptive analytics, and also computational phenotyping. And I'm asking, are we using outdated taxonomy of disease? This is, a, you know, you get down to a bear, and, and this is what we do for animals. I mean, we really, we really hone down to a species, and we've got a very good understanding of that. But, but what about in medicine? Really, there are only two types of heart failure, basically, or really only two types of diabetes. MI, you know, we predict MI, but do you think plaque rupture is very different than dissection? It's, it's different from, you know, someone who's had an embolism, the different, you know, what different than supply demand troponin leak? I mean, we shouldn't be calling them all AMI, let alone ACS. We should be talking precisely about what it is. Now, we do have some taxonomy around MI, but I would tell you we did our own taxonomy for young women with MI because we found that the larger taxonomy that had been created didn't fit young women. And young women, by the way, had a very different pattern than did young men. But it's, we're not going to make progress if the, what we're calling it is so imprecise, is so muddy. And we're in an era where we should be able to triangulate different amounts of information and be able to talk more precisely. I believe that many of the trials fail because you're bringing in people who have vastly different pathophysiologies and responses to different therapies. The heart failure trials, I believe, have largely failed because it's an extraordinarily heterogeneous population. The MI trials probably succeed because type 1 MI, the plaque rupture, is the predominant, is the predominant manifestation. But whether or not that's actually beta blockers or aspirin or any of these things are valid for someone who's had another type of MI is anyone's question. We've never even questioned it. We just call it MI. Even though it's likely that in the trials, those other types beside plaque rupture were not well represented. And we have very little information on it. These are, I'm showing you these because these are diffusion maps. And we're starting to try to take high-dimensional data 
and map them in multi-dimensional space and try to understand neighborhoods, who's like who, based on multiple characteristics and try to see whether or not there's a data-driven approach to understanding what's similar and what's different. And then we're ultimately going to want to know what implication does that have for prediction? What implication does that have to response to therapy? Is that something worthy of integrating in? In the end, we're looking at groups like this and we're calling them all the same thing. But as you start to, to tease apart and understand and measure more, you start seeing that the groups really separate in ways that are consequential, that matter to their risk, matter to their response to therapy, and should be important to the kind of decisions that are being made. But we are on the cusp of this in medicine and in cardiology today. We have yet to fully exploit this. And so you're going to see a transition from a time where people are giving just a lecture on heart failure or MI to where we're going to have to become more precise in our language, in our understanding, in our classification, in our matching our therapeutic strategies to what it is that people actually have. This computational phenotyping, like I said, has, has implications for study and practice. I think these broad-based guidelines, which are making large-scale recommendations, which, by the way, represented an advance in their time from a place where people weren't collating systematically the evidence and trying to make recommendations, and they've been very important to improving quality. But I see them as a starting point, not an end. And ultimately, people are going to be saying, who are people like me? What's, what is it, what's the experience of people like me? And any single center is not going to be able to do that. We're going to have to hold hands, pool data, learn from large numbers. It's a paradox. In order to understand about small, precise groups, you have to have massive numbers in order to bring together those groups. And why computational phenotyping? Because it's, it's, it's in part the type of methods that are being used, but in part it's only now that we've been able to harness the power of the kind of analytics that we need, that we have the computational power that can exist by pooling resources either with supercomputers or Hadoop clusters that enable us to do calculations at a speed that's necessary in order to provide the kind of answers in the time frame that's necessary. Now, you're also seeing stuff like this. Uh, this guy, Kosla, is a, a sort of very famous uh, VC in, um, in Silicon Valley. Of course, Silicon Valley loves to make predictions about the future. And, uh, you know, whether they're right or not, it depends. But, but he says technology replaces 80 percent of what doctors do. Doctors find this very threatening. I, well, you would. But, but, but I think what we're talking about in this instance, and he backed off this 80 percent, but there's a lot that we do that technology could do for us. So we could spend more of our time doing the things that we uniquely can contribute to, which is part of helping with decision making and connecting with patients. But, but part of it is also about reading images, for example, so that there's assists that are, are it's experts on our shoulder that are doing this. And DeepMind, which is a piece of, a part of uh, Google now, which is working with the NHS, they say clinician-led, patient-centered. It's sort of the mantra that's occurring. It's not really replace, but it's expert on the shoulder that's to try to support and, and, uh, and move forward. And this is, I recommend this kind of work to, we, I have no idea exactly whether this is gonna bear fruit, but you're seeing more and more of these kind of associations. It started with uh, work that they did actually before they got involved with the NHS. You may know this game Go. It's very popular in the, in the Far East and particularly China. And it's claimed that it's the most complex game in the world due to the number of variation of individual games. And, and the masters of Go are, 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 are heroes. You know, they're people who are put on a pedestal and, and are, are, devote their lives to it. But these guys in deep mind, uh, just like in chess, but Go's felt to be more complex than chess, even you know, found ways to master it. And this is where, it, is this artificial intelligence moving fast enough that we'll be able to employ it in ways that we've never thought of before? Talk about Deep Mind. this guy from Sinai um, put together this group that started to say, can we take the EHR, and he's calling it Deep Patient, where we have these sort of vectorized representations of patients based on all the information on the EHR. The only issue is all of us know that three-quarters of the information in the HR is something you wouldn't want to do a lot with. So, you know, figuring out what's meaningful in the HR, how it can be used, what we can do with these advanced techniques uh, are, is all going to be part of the challenge. Um, I think uh, this, I'll just go through this sort of quickly, but this is a really important paper that recently came out with using a, a, a single um, convolutional neural network trained a general skin lesion classification system and they matched the performance of 21 dermatologists 
uh, tested across three tests. They sort of basically took this, they took a picture of it, and they found they could be as good as the dermatologists in, in classifying uh, them according to these uh, categories. This fast and scalable method is deployable on mobile devices and holds the potential for substantial clinical impact, including broadening the scope of primary care practice. And you can imagine anywhere in the world, in, the, in, in anywhere, any continent, uh, as far from medical care as you can imagine, you could equip someone with a mobile phone. They can begin to have the tools that, that were only available to people with top dermatology departments in the past. And I think this is the kind of automation you're going to see. Our own tools are going to undergo change. I think the idea of, of listening, uh, this may be heresy, but listening to the heart sounds is going to undergo evolution. We'll have better instruments to, to listen, process, and produce interpretations that will be standardized. Um, I will say that there's also now smartphone ultrasound devices that uh, the question is, is this going to be the new stethoscope? Uh, you have a pioneer in ultrasound here, uh, uh, one of the greats in uh, echocardiography. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that Dr. Quinones has seen and thought about how this fits into care. Where is it that you need a skilled echocardiographer? Where does this become a mainstream uh, a part of the thing? These... Uh, You've seen Alexa, and now Google's come out with these AI home assistants. You can imagine for people who have trouble manipulating a, a mobile device, how this is going to be a, a, you know, a way to input information and to transmit information, and this is going to undergo a big change. And then also the wearables, everyone uh, has been seeing those too. All of this stuff is going to be generating more and more data that's going to be relevant to our practices. And so one of the central premises here is that Data generated every day for a variety of practical purposes could serve as an inexhaustible source of knowledge to fuel a learning healthcare system. And I think this is where the other, the, the piece is going to be the analytics, but it's also going to be how you get the data and, and how it's used. Uh, Eric Topol uh, wrote this piece with, a, with a, a, a lawyer. This is a kind of a collaboration between law and medicine where he's saying we can't access our records, but, but hackers can get to them. And the question is how are we going to make data securely more available, how is it going to be able to be pooled, how are we going to be able to get the information we need in order to make these kind of advances. And, and what we're seeing at the same time is that people want to be involved. This movement of consumerism in medicine is gaining speed. It's, it's, it's not going to be denied. And if we're smart, we're going to find ways to channel it, partner with people, put them in a position where medicine is going to have more and more engaged individuals as our partners the people who we formerly called patients and treated hierarchically and often paternalistically are going to want to be participants. They're going to want to know. They're going to want to see. They're going to want to understand. And they're going to want choice. And this is something which I think you're seeing in greater, uh, greater frequency. Uh, Sharon Terry, one of my personal heroes, a, a citizen scientist, uh, she says, she's talking about research here, participants who we formerly called subjects, remember kingdom subjects, is that really how it should be? Or is it participants and partners? That's what it probably should be and will be. Participants want not only to be invited to the table, but also to design and host the meal with other stakeholders. They want to be part of this. And this is going to drive down the cost of recruitment, the ability to engage and retain people in studies. They are our partners in this. All of us, the Precision Medicine Initiative is built on this premise. Uh, the Cancer Moonshot similarly is built on the premise of getting people as participants and having them share their data with researchers so that we're not chasing their data and, and co coaxing them to be in our studies, but actually we're coming together as, as communities, we're working together, and data become, come uh, uh, out as a result of that. Sue Hellman at Gates says, I believe the most important <coughs> requirement for new knowledge network envisioned by the Precision Medicine Report is that it be driven by patients. Sue is saying here, that the, one of the greatest innovations of the Precision Medicine Initiative is not just its goal to create knowledge, but its commitment to involve people as partners, and not just subjects or hierarchically or paternalistically. Um, and in this piece, uh, for the benefits of digital medicine to be fully realized, we need not only to find a shared home for personal health data, but also to give individuals the right to own them. This is a unique moment where we may be able to provide for personal control and at the same time create a global knowledge medical resource. You're hearing this more and more and I think it's going to be a new trend in medicine. Um, Moonshot says the enormous value of data being generated by cancer researchers, clinicians, and patients today requires a national infrastructure to share, combine, and analyze these data 
We're going to start to create ways that this gets done. A lever for this is going to be patient rights. <clears throat> in the preamble to the original privacy rule in 2000, HHS cited a well-established principle that an individual or designated representative should have access right to data and information in his or her record. There's ambiguity about who owns the medical record. There's no ambiguity about people's right to access it. This right is routinely being denied by data holders, including healthcare systems. They provide a portal and a blue button, but they're not giving notes. There's a whole lot of information that we're making it very difficult for patients to access. I believe this will change. It'll change because the regs are there. It'll change because PMI is pushing it. It'll change because people will start demanding it. And, and just as I, I get to the end, I want to say and disclose that I'm working on a solution to this because I think there need to be many solutions to this. If people want their digital data, where are they going to put it? And so there needs to be ways for people to gain apps freely, to be able to uh, aggregate and have harmonized the data from different sources, from, from covered entities, data holders, health systems, different health systems, different vendors, EHR agnostic, from, from wearables and from information that they might provide as they report information. And then they need to be able to have it in a place that's secure, and they need to know it's not going to be shared or moved without their permission. It's not a game where it gets de-identified and sold, but it's theirs, it's held. They're honored by, by the privilege of being able to work with them. We honor them by the, by the privilege they give us to work with them and their data, and it changes the game. So we've talked about how it's collected and organized and shared. Others, I hope, will come in. It, it, it's, a, it's a time to provide these single platforms, and I believe the self-reported data is an important part of this, where you can ping people and they can tell you their symptoms, how they feel, the satisfaction, and we make this really easy and seamless. And that information flows back to them, and if they, with their permission, they can share it with clinicians or researchers or whoever else. But we empower them with the data. That asset has been leveraged by almost everybody else, but the people who the data is about. It's time to acknowledge that we have a responsibility to enable them to get their data assets, and then we can partner with them. And I believe the strategic advantage in the future will be the health systems and researchers and clinicians that know how to best work with people, sharing data, being transparent, respecting their agency over their data, and them as adults will able to, to be involved in the decisions at some level. It will be the ones that will lead to the future. So we built this as permission-based, easy, and secure. People ought to be able to have their own health-related data. That's the premise, and be able to share it. So in the end here, I just want to say, I, thought, I like this. Topol put this on one of his uh, tweets. At some point, it was old medicine and new medicine. Old medicine's population-based. New medicine's individualized. Old is one-off, doctor's office. The other's real-time streaming, real world. Doctor-ordered data between, now it's patient-generated data. Doctor notes, but now it's our notes. By the way, there are ways for patients to keep a diary, start to have notes. We have ways to process that information and share it so we can begin to understand the music before, not just singular healthcare encounters. Information owned by doctors and hospitals in the future owned by, by um, the rightful owner. Expensive big ticket tech versus cheap chips, Moore's Law, data limited, you're gonna get panoramic views. We're gonna have an abundance of data coming from different sources. Our challenge is to use it wisely. I did wanna just also end by, I'm talking about a futuristic approach. I'm talking a lot about data and information but it only works if we retain the key humanistic values that pervade medicine. So for us, it's going to be about how we enhance our performance, but we stay tuned in to the needs of individuals and all of those human aspects of it. The, the way in which we treat people, care for them, provide support, coach, and, and I think it's gonna be critically important. And, and I put Bill up here because for me, he. He rep also represents someone who exemplifies these values. I've known him for a long time, and, and he's an inspiration to me around the way that he takes patient care. And I also wanted to acknowledge, again, my great honor of being here for the Winters lecture. And, and I read this uh, commencement address that uh, Dr. Winters put together, and, and he said, treat your patients as you would wish to be treated. It's a good thing that we should all live by and is uh, so critically important, even as Many of our tools will evolve. Many of our capabilities will evolve. I hope our, our capacity to individualize and focus on what each individual needs and respect their rights will evolve. But our commitment to connect with them as people and meet them where they are and provide the great service for them as humans, uh, connecting with each other will always retain. And treat your patients, you'll be treated very wise words.
thank you very much.